Hey, hey, hey! Welcome to my cosy corner of the internet. This is Nephilim VA bringing you the sixth chapter of our Painted Stages Fall Apart by Scenes, which is written by Silverheart SP on AO3. Bakugo has taken his and Deku's lives into his own hands. Will it be worth it? We can only find out after the trigger warnings for this emotional roller coaster or wump that is this fanfiction. This fanfiction is for general audiences, with themes of fluff and angst, near-death experiences, and canon-typical violence. Also be aware of slight manga spoilers. If that isn't your style, then I recommend a real James Bond type, which is written by Hybrid Empress on AO3. It can be found on my channel! Brace yourselves, everybody. Now I implore you to sit back and relax whilst I read to you. Chapter 6 Smoke cleared, mirrors broke. Shota waited stoically in the foyer for his students, tense with nerves. He was more than ready for another round of searching, he knew his students were more than ready for their first round. In the most productive use of his time, his mind sorted through what to expect, how he might be able to keep half an eye on all his students at all times, how to console them if they saw the worst. It was a few minutes into his intense thoughts when he was interrupted by the sound of the entrance door opening. He glanced upwards. In the doorway stood All Might, in all his scraggly glory. His features were sunken and haunted. He looked like he had aged a decade overnight. Before Shota could even open his mouth, All Might began talking hurriedly. I heard what's going on from Sukauchi, he said desperately. His eyes were wide and his hands were trembling. Please, please let me come. I, I need to be there for my students, both those in trouble and those aiding. I... I have police permission, I just... I need it, just... just please. You want to come? Questioned Shota, cutting off the other man. All Might stopped short, but nodded jerkily after a very slight hesitation. Y yes he said. I know I won't be able to help directly with the heroes, but I know how to do some of the police work involved at the scene, and I, I have permission from Sukauchi to be there so they won't ask me to leave. Fine, said Shota shortly, All Might's expression twisted into one of great relief. Shota didn't really see any disadvantage bringing the man along would add, and he didn't have time to put any more thought into it than that. It was probably a good idea to have another staff member present supervising his class, besides, just in case Shota got caught in something. The other UA faculty members present would be working by themselves or supervising their own classes. Thank you, All Might breathed. Something the man was actually good for was comfort. He would be good to have nearby to ease any stressed out or terrified children. The two lapsed into silence, waiting for the class. The students exceeded Shota's expectations. They were changed and ready to leave with ten minutes to spare, which they did not waste. Several of them looked more determined than he'd ever seen them, Todoroki his eyes intense and cold, Uraraka a stony stare in place, not a smile to be seen, Kaminari and Jiro, for once not bantering, instead standing silent and serious. Ashido and Saro, smiles on their faces in the face of fear. Even Asui, who was rarely ever expressive, conveyed a commanding and prepared presence through the way she was standing up straight. Shota and All Might crowded them all into the private bus, a bit haphazardly with the absence of Ida to organise them. Their determination was their friend, however, and they all were seated quickly and the bus was moving well before Shota would have expected. Their drive was filled with students either tense and silent, or muttering to their seat partner about the mission. Shota overlooked them all with a stoic gaze, while All Might sat still in the front seat, not saying or doing anything. 
it threw Shota off a little bit. All Might must be incredibly worried. Traffic was merciful this morning, so they were only delayed slightly. Without the ten minutes to spare his students had created, they would have been late. Instead, they arrived almost exactly on time. His class filed out of the bus in an organised manner, taking in the disaster zone that was once the left wing of the museum with wide eyes. Shota stood before them, overlooking this group of children who had been asked to conduct an important and stressful task. He was so, so proud of them, no hesitation in accepting, and all of them were eager and determined to do their best. Even if they didn't find their two classmates, or or if they were too late, Shota would make it clear that he was proud of them. All right, listen up, he announced, his class at attention. You are to get your instructions and designated search sections from the policemen stationed around the area. Do not crowd them. Treat this mission as the serious case that it is. You will address me as a racer head, and all your classmates by their hero names. If you are unsure on how to proceed at any point, take initiative and ask someone nearby who would know. Are you all ready? There was a collection of nods all around. Shota looked at his class and saw fire in their eyes. Good, he said. Without another word, Shota stepped around them to begin making his way towards his own designated section. He was halted by the presence of All Might, who had made himself small and scarce since they had left the bus. It was so out of character for the man that Shota was even a little bit surprised at his sudden appearance. I'll be assisting the police if you need me, All Might said quietly, motioning to the nearest group of officers. Shota nodded, knowing All Might could take care of himself and they had no more time to waste. He continued towards his location, adamant that this would be the last day searching for his students. Ochako and Jiro had been stationed in the same area, alongside several pro heroes and one student from the second years. They all worked in laborious silence, too focused on their tasks to pay attention to those around them. A race ahead was one section away from them, so they could spot one another from across the rubble often. Paramedics ran around all over the place, attending to uncovered victims, carrying them off the site, and helping remove obstruction when applicable. Ochako didn't linger on the vulnerable forms of those being helped for too long, determined to remain focused. She and Jiro had been paired due to high quirk compatibility in this scenario. Jiro was able to listen for surviving victims buried deep within the destruction, while Ochako would be able to safely float the rubble on top of them off and to the side, and perhaps even float the victim free before the paramedics would take over. Ochako couldn't tell what part of the museum this actually used to be. All she could see around her was piles and piles of rock and debris that all looked the same. Occasionally, a scrap of what used to be there would make itself known. A torn and water-damaged poster. A shattered display case. The severed arm of a sculpture. A scenario materialised itself in her mind. Deku, Ida, and all their other friends walking into the exhibit with excitement and awe. Deku going off on an excited tangent about heroes, wanting to absorb it all faster than the others could manage and going off on his own. Ochako was so, so relieved that four of their friends were safe and okay. As soon as she could, probably after she was done here, she was going to go straight to the hospital and hug them all tightly. She had been completely, utterly, totally terrified and worried for them. But Deku and Bakugo, they were still missing. They were still trapped somewhere amongst all this destruction. Helpless, probably terrified, dying of thirst. Ochako quickly shook herself off when she felt herself begin to breathe heavily. A pro shouldn't dwell on these things until the job was done, especially rescue heroes, which was her end goal. It was just a terrible coincidence that this particular mission was somewhat personal to her. 
she floated several large chunks of debris off a victim, pointedly suppressing her emotions as she spotted a splatter of deep red on some of them. The most she could allow was a leap of her heart and a stab of sympathy as paramedics surrounded the newly uncovered victim. Next to her, Jiro turned her head to face Ochako. How are you doing? She asked lowly. The two hadn't been speaking much, too intimidated by the seriousness of the mission to do anything. Ochako breathed in shakily. Yeah, she said softly. As they shuffled back a bit, the paramedics had transported the victim onto a stretcher and were quickly but carefully carting him away. I'm doing okay, she trailed off. Her stomach flipped as Deku's kind face filled her mind. Bakugo's brash determination. Both of them could be. They could be. Jiro placed a hand on her shoulder in concern. Ochako wouldn't be surprised if she had picked up on her suddenly spiked heart rate. She closed her eyes, deep breaths. Neither she nor her classmates could afford for her to lose it right now. Right, she said firmly, her eyes snapping open. She turned to Jiro, who also admittedly didn't look like she was doing so well. Her face was twisted with worry, all the more reason to get them both back on task. Let's go, she said, pointing to the next raised pile along their area. Jiro's face smoothed out and she nodded. The two of them carefully made their way across, stepping over large bits of rubble and destruction. Halfway there, Jiro stopped suddenly, her brow furrowing. Ochako also stopped and turned to face her. Her expression was one of deepening confusion as opposed to the expected worry. What? began Ochako, concerned at the unexpected expression from Jiro. I... The other girl began slowly. The long earphone jacks on her earlobes were extended and stood still and alert. I hear something, she said, now staring intently at the ground. Something really, really weird. What? asked Ochako, bewildered. It sounds like... She cut off abruptly, her eyes widening. Move! She suddenly yelled, grabbing Ochako's arm and beginning to run. Ochako made a confused noise, but was too caught off guard to stop herself from helplessly following Jiro. She ran them all the way to the edge of their section, where nearby, a race ahead was doing his own work. He sharply looked over at their panicked appearance. What's happening? He asked, stopping his work momentarily. There's something coming from down there, sir, panted Jiro, letting go of Ochako's arm and pointing over. Ochako could only stand by in confusion, turning to look back at where they had been standing. What do you mean? asked a race ahead, not missing a beat. Jiro gulped. From underground, I mean, she clarified nervously. They were really loud and harsh, and they were close by. It sounded like... She stopped suddenly, her eyes widened. Explosions, she whispered. The three of them stared at one another in silence. Bakugo, said a race ahead finally, his face and voice serious. Jiro nodded, that being the only logical explanation. Ochako gave a small gasp, and felt the knot of nerves in her stomach tighten at the revelation. What what do we do? She asked helplessly, turning her nervous eyes to their teacher. There's no time to do anything, he said gravely, staring over at where Jiro had pointed. We won't be able to contact him to tell him to stop, or get to him without risk of being blown up. We have to wait for him to get tired, or reach the surface. On cue, an odd, distant, deep sound came into the peripheral of Ochako's hearing. The ground shook slightly. A racerhead's face darkened. 
Here he comes, he said. The paramedics and other heroes in the area all stopped short at the slight tremor in the ground, looking around in confusion. A race ahead was quick to shout at them to move, and by the time the next rubble protruded up from the earth, they had all scrambled a safe distance away. Earphone Jack, are there any victims in the vicinity that might be at risk from Barkago's detonations? Asked a race ahead, staring at the area with intensity. N no I'm pretty sure there aren't, said Jiro without hesitation, which made Ochako more confident with it being true. The three of them flinched at another explosion, this time louder. The ground shook harder. Suddenly, without warning, there was a bright flash of light and a familiar booming noise. Ochako screeched and covered her face as rocks and bits of rubble went flying in all directions, and the three of them were buffeted with dust and crumbs of gravel. In the middle of it all, a familiar voice shouted hoarsely. The noise and light died down in a second, and Ochako peeked through her arms. The area was shrouded in a veil of dust, and Jiro was coughing next to her. Eraserhead hadn't reacted, but had pulled down his goggles. A horrible, strangled panting was coming from the center point of the explosion. Ochako lowered her arms and squinted. Not waiting any longer than needed, a race ahead ran towards where the sounds had been coming from. After glancing at each other with wide eyes, Ochako and Jiro followed, careful not to trip over the now more dangerous environment. The dust settled fairly quickly and the two clambered over a large pile of rocks to the scene of a race ahead on one knee, leaning over Barkago. Barkago... Barkago looked terrible. He was kneeling in the middle of the crumbled remains of some rubble, coughing harshly and painfully. His blonde hair was matted with dried blood, and fresh blood splattered onto the ground in front of him as he coughed. His face was filthy, caked in ugly-looking grime, and his eyes were narrowed and reddened from sudden exposure to light. He trembled harshly, his chest was bare, and covered all over in ugly, molted bruising. Ochako felt sick as she noticed his wrist. It was obviously broken, Bakugo holding it out of the way gingerly. The fact he had managed to explode himself out from being deeply buried with that was beyond impressive. He must be in so much pain. Behind him, rubble crumbled into and filled up a large gap that was once an opening where he had come through. Bark a go, a race ahead was saying sharply, holding one hand on the boy's shoulder. Around them, the heroes and paramedics from earlier were emerging. Upon seeing him, the paramedics quickly left, presumably to get a stretcher and more help. Ochako and Jiro glanced at each other again with wide eyes, before both simultaneously deciding to go over and crouch next to their teacher. Bakugo let out one more cough, the sound being gravelly and awful and making Ochako wince. Without a word, he used his good hand to tug on Eraserhead's arm, and pointed shakily back at the covered gap he had come from with his bad hand. Eraserhead ignored him, doing a serious once-over to determine if any field medicine could be applied on the spot. Ochako, however, noticed. She nervously glanced at the foreboding-looking gap, not liking anything to do with this situation other than Bakugo being alive. A race ahead began speaking to Bakugo again in a low voice, reassurances and muttered soothing phrases. Jiro had taken initiative and had one of her earphone jacks pressed at his throat and the other at his chest, checking his breathing and heart rate. I... Aizawa, came a rough voice. A racer had stopped talking abruptly, looking down at his student with an unreadable face. Bakugo pointed back at the gap, and this time a racer had followed his eyes sharp and piercing as they stared a straight line from where he was pointing. D D Deku, he breathed, and Ochako's eyes widened. Jiro, too, stopped, the two of them turning to stare at the ominous opening. Midoriya? 
clarified Eraserhead, looking back at Barkago. Barkago nodded weakly, taking in another ragged breath. G get d d down there! <laughs> Fast! He struggled, coughing again. He's... he's in a, a she-hole. She no time, please. Eraserhead stood and turned to Ochako and Jiro. The two straightened instinctively at his intense gaze. Uravity, earphone jack, stay here with Barkago, he said. Make sure he gets help immediately. I have to go and find someone who can help me dig this tunnel out. Then we'll go in and be back with Midoriya. Ochako could only nod numbly, and the next second a race ahead was running back over the destruction in the direction of the other heroes. She and Jiro were left with a sweating, panting Bakugo, who was trembling from head to toe. He let out another cough and Ochako quickly sprung into action. She gently held his shoulders and lowered him down so he was lying on his back, his head tilted to the side in case he threw up. Jiro followed her by once again placing her earphone jacks on his chest and throat, probing for issues. Ochako took over the surface examination, cringing at the battered state of his body. She was halfway through applying a splint to his wrist when the paramedics returned. Thanks, honey. We'll take it from here, one of them said, laying down the stretcher they had bought. She was quickly at Bakugo's side, taking him from under his arms while the other took his legs. They lifted him quickly and smoothly onto the stretcher, and both lifted it and carried it away. Ochako and Jiro were left in silence. Ochako didn't like it. She needed to do something, anything, to help their teacher. She turned back towards the gap, then back at Jiro. Do you... Do you think it would help Mr. Er Eraserhead if I floated some rocks away from there? Asked Ochako, a concerned frown on her face. It, it might save him some trouble. Jiro thoughtfully tilted her head towards the opening. From the sounds of it, Bakugo hasn't managed to actually clear a path for Eraserhead to follow. So, yeah, I think you probably could help. That was all Ochako needed. She quickly stood up and sprinted towards the gap. The environment they were standing on was pretty much just a massive pile of broken building. The villains had blown up both the ground floor and the basement of the building, which had caused the ceiling of the basement, which was also the floor of the ground floor, to collapse inward and cause the two floors to become one in the form of a giant pile of rubble. Bakugo's tunnel out reflected this, the gap he had emerged from was still obvious, but a race ahead would have to dig an actual tunnel to get to Deku. Ochako decided to make it easier for him to get started, and thought trying to make a larger hole would be the best idea. She got to work quickly, floating a large section of rocks away from the opening, beginning to make a tunnel that was as stable as she could manage. Jiro came to join her. Ochako would float rocks away from the opening, while Jiro would plug into them and destroy them with her sound wave so they didn't act as more collateral. They worked silently and efficiently, other heroes eventually coming in to join them in helping to remove rocks or destroy the extras, or continue looking for survivors. As Ochako diligently floated the rubble, all she could think about was how terrified Deku must be. Thank you so much for watching this video, I appreciate all the support you've given me. I hadn't thought about using Jiro's earphone jacks like a stethoscope before, but it makes so much sense. I honestly love that. It is officially spooky season. Do you celebrate Halloween? Funnily enough, my family never really celebrated it until I was like 16 or 17. All credits go to the original creator of this fanfiction, SilverheartSP on AO3. I would highly appreciate it if you gave this video a like and you subscribe to their channel and you hit the notification bell to be notified of when I next upload. There is no pressure to do so though. Thank you for visiting my cosy corner of the internet. Keep growing my sunflowers. Mwah.